Welcome everyone. We are very happy to have Eric Permuter from SACLE, who is going to tell us about his work on 2D safety spectra. <clears throat> Slava and the organizers of the conference for, for inviting me to give this talk. It's great to be back here on the internet. Um, and uh, it's an honor to, to talk to the collaboration about this uh, work from last year with Justin Cady, uh, which I was asked to talk about, but it ties in, uh, in my opinion, nicely with some work that is going to come out, I think, next week with Nathan Benjamin, Scott Collier, Liam Fitzpatrick, and Alex Maloney. So, good. <clears throat> so, so I think the, the point of view about 2D CFT in the modern era is fairly captured by uh, this quote, um, which I'll give you a moment to digest. Um, the basic point being, being kind of obvious uh, once you get to the middle, which is that uh, in fact, 2D CFTs have not been solved. And uh, one could easily argue that we have no clue what the generic 2D CFT looks like. Um, this idea of missing pieces was first introduced by Shel Silverstein in this book, but uh, later reprised by Shein in his Tazi 2017 lectures. And so the question is, what are we missing? And what I want to try to explain or convince you of today is that it's not the constraints that we're missing. So what is it? Well, <clears throat> we know that CFTs are based on very strong constraints. Um, writing the partition function like this, where I've pulled out the vacuum because I'm ultimately concerned with, with compact CFTs, uh, and these chi's are vr sorrow characters in, in the generic case, uh, the partition function of a unitary compact CFT must obey the following properties. So first of all, it must be modular invariant under the full SL2Z, modulo theories of fermions, which can be invariant under a subgroup instead. Uh, the density of states rho must be positive, that's unitarity. It should be in a compact CFT, discrete, uh, which means that it's a sum of delta functions weighted by some degeneracies, which I call D, H comma H bar. And it should obey integrality, which is the statement that D uh, should be an integer. And the message of, of the talk, if nothing else, is that we've not fully leveraged these constraints. We need to understand how to use them better. And I think a lot of physics will come out when we do that. <clears throat> so just to look back on how we think about this problem uh, for the last several years in, into the CFT uh, with, with modularity in particular, uh, the modular bootstrap program takes the point of view of assuming positivity, enforcing modularity and asking what pops out. So why do we do it this way? Well, first of all, it works pretty well. Uh, papers by Cardi and Sidney Hellerman, of course, many others have shown us that there's a lot to learn. Uh, positivity is a very transparent physical principle that we hold dear, it's easy to understand, and we generally don't you know, want to consider theories about it, modular the interesting physics of non-unitary CFT. We can process the vr sorrow symmetry very easily, the characters are known and they're simple. And finally, if you wanted to imagine taking an alternative approach where you just scan the space of functions that could plausibly stand in as partition functions of compact CFTs that are, say, chaotic or irrational, that space is basically empty. So we're left to construct these or constrain these ourselves. And by that space is empty, I mean that space of known such functions. <clears throat> but discreteness, much less integrality, is not imposed in the modular bootstrap. And so it's very much an open question, what are the abstract implications of discreteness and integrality for the space and properties of 2D CFTs? On the other hand, modular invariance itself has not been fully harnessed. Uh, and so you could equally ask, is there a different way to harness modularity of 2D CFTs than what we've been doing? <clears throat> so for me, I like to think about the following question, which ties these together, uh, which is very much in the bootstrap spirit. How much information does it take to completely specify a CFT? Now, uh, returning to a rather restricting to, to local operators, the full list of OPE data, the dimensions, the OPE coefficients might actually be more than one needs, even though usually we say that in the local operator sector, that's what we have to, to specify. So the Cardi formula and the Lightcomb bootstrap can be thought of in this vein, where some of the data is specified and then some of the other data is already fixed by some constraint. Uh, 
And part of the talk today will be to present some stronger versions of this fact that, in fact, some of the data is redundant. <clears throat> so from my point of view, it's useful to frame today's talk with an excerpt from a motivating paper from 2010 by Mike Douglas, which was called something like Spaces of Quantum Field Theories, which has some very nice ideas, uh, which I think are inspirational for the bootstrap approach. And in this, he writes down a conjecture, which is that there exists an H growing linearly with C, such that if two CFTs agree in their spectrum and three-point functions for all operators with H less than or equal to H, <laughs> and likewise for H bar, they must be the same CFT. Okay. So this is, of course, an outstanding conjecture. Um, and we can consider this just for the spectrum. So for about, forget about the OP coefficients. Let's just ask about whether the spectrum obeys some version of this in a 2D CFT. And before going further, I should say, this is all by way of some you know, overarching motivational introduction. Uh, we'll transition to, to the details of, of the papers um, soon. But I think part of the talk is to just get across what, how I want you to think about this. So this phenomenon that the CFT spectrum may be determined by some low-lying set of operators, I'm going to call spectral determinacy. It's well known that in holomorphic CFTs, the spectrum of dimensions H greater than C over 24 is determined by its complement. This is just a basic fact about uh, meromorphic modular functions of which the partition function of holomorphic CFT must be one. And the light operators, namely those with dimension less than C over 24, sometimes called the polar terms in the partition function. Uh, in ADS, these would be say light particles or perhaps conical defects. And determining these degeneracies then in turn determines the degeneracies of the nonpolar states, the heavy states dual to black holes. And I use this in a generalized sense because there's no uh, restriction to holomorphic CFTs when we talk about holography, but I think you know what I mean and using that terminology. So conventional wisdom holds that such a mechanism is special to holomorphic CFT. And that for general CFTs, if you look at the spectrum of dimensions or twists defined here as a little t, then the spectrum above some cutoff h uh, is not uniquely determined by the spectrum below. But actually, we'll prove otherwise. All CFTs obey precise versions of spectral determinacy. And to state this imprecisely, uh, this cutoff H is C over 12. And part of the rest of the talk will be devoted to giving the precise versions, of course. <clears throat> Those results will be part of a larger endeavor addressing the questions I asked before. And so the talk will be cleaved into two. First, we'll talk about the constraints of discreteness and integrality. Uh, and next, then we'll move on to, to modularity. So first, just to give an overview of what, what I'll say, in the first segment, we'll mainly focus on rational CFTs, which I remind you are not classified, despite being rational, uh, which are a finite number of characters of modules with respect to an extended Carroll algebra A. In a theory uh, like this, the torus observables are constructed by gluing vector value modular forms on the left and on the right. The components of these are the characters of the blocks of the extended algebra. And so what we're going to do is constrain properties of these VVMFs uh, and in turn, interpret them in terms of rational CFT. So these physics results will follow, in particular, from opposing discreteness and integrality in VVMS without positivity. So I'm emphasizing that because this is a bootstrap workshop and positivity is so central to a lot that we do. Here, I'm trying to show that you don't need positivity to get interesting results out. At least in rational CFTs, you can make this explicit. So one thing that follows from this is that rational CFTs obey twist determinacy with this cutoff H exactly equal to C over 12. And we'll also talk about a bootstrap bound on rational points that live on conformal manifolds, uh, a bootstrap bound in the traditional sense of there being an operator below some threshold, uh, which follows from, from these constraints. Now on to modularity, where we'll talk about general CFTs, no, no rational CFT constraint, although it includes rational theories. So what might we expect in this spectral determinacy question? Well, intuition from 3D gravity and what we know about holomorphic CFTs and various modular formulas suggest important distinctions between light and heavy operators where that threshold, again, is roughly C over 12 or C minus some constant that depends on the number of currents you have in the chiral algebra. In 3D gravity, heavy states are dual to black holes, and black holes form from collapse. 
So it's a fair question to ask whether the spectrum and dynamics of the light states fix the theory completely. Because if you can only form black holes by collapsing light stuff, then you might wonder whether the microstate counts are uniquely fixed once you've fixed your light stuff. This is meant to be heuristic, but it's just motivational. You could also ask whether the light states fix the theory just approximately, or perhaps just semi-classically. And so the result that we'll find along these lines is that in a generic CFT, by which I mean a CFT with Virasoro symmetry and C greater than one, the full primary spectrum is determined by this subset of degeneracies. All of the light states, which are to the left of this dashed line, the entire scalar spectrum, and the entire spin one spectrum. So if you hand me that, then the entire spectrum of the CFT is determined. Okay, so where does that come from? And then we'll transition to the meat of the talk. This follows from writing the partition function of a generic CFT in a completely different way than the way I wrote it before. Instead of using a character expansion, we're going to employ harmonic analysis on the fundamental domain of SL2C to decompose partition functions in a manifestly modular invariant basis. This is a little bit thorny, um, and the thorns are interesting, but an especially nice setting is when you look at free boson CFTs, um, and we'll do some explicit calculations, which I'll just touch on. They're a little bit tangential to this talk, although most of the paper is spent sort of calculating. Uh, in that setting. But for general CFTs, the subtleties are revealing. Um, and I'll try to argue that they shed new light on the way gravity in ADS3 hides in the structure of 2D CFTs, uh, and maybe even suggest some ideas to extend notions of ensemble averaging to a more generic setting. OK, so much for motivation. Um, here's the outline for the rest of the talk, which is short. And I basically already said what we're going to do. So. Um, of course, I'm happy to take your questions at any time. Um, so please feel free to interrupt at any time. Okay. My computer wants to restart and I'm not gonna let it. All right. <clears throat> so um, we're gonna start in the realm of rational CFTs. So we have some uh, modular invariant function F and let's suppose that it can be written as a gluing of two vector value modular forms, uh, V and V bar, where this Nij is a gluing matrix, and the V sub i of Q are components of a d-dimensional VVMF. So this thing transforms in a d-dimensional representation of the modular group. And uh, I should say, as far as notation, here are Q, Q bar, and tau. So this will be notation I'll use throughout the talk, uh, nothing you haven't seen. When we take f to be a partition function of a rational CFT, v sub i is a chiral character. And there are d of them uh, in the theory in question, <clears throat> where d is the dimensionality of the VVMF. Components of the VVMF solve MDEs, which are modular differential equations, in this case, modular linear differential equations. Sometimes they're called MLDEs. Uh, I prefer to use three letters instead of four. So um, what are these? Well, they're, they're pretty nice looking differential equations, uh, which act on the components of the VVMF, like so. You form the modular covariant derivative with E2. You compose a bunch of these. And then you take linear combinations where you weight them by modular forms, uh, where in this notation, the modular form has weight 2R. And in fact, it can be weakly holomorphic, which is to say it can have poles. And the order of the poles is bounded above by some parameter L, which is sometimes called the Ronskian index. For today's talk, I'm going to treat the simple case of L equals 0 and D greater than 1. Uh, L equals 0 is sometimes called monic, where associated to that term is the fact that the coefficient of the leading operator is 1. Otherwise, these are just you know, uh, comprised from E4 and E6 in the case where you take L equals 0. What okay. does you limit to this case L equals 0? It means it's going to apply not to all CFTs, but to some CFTs. Um, so for every L or is the equation for some L? What I'm going to prove becomes trivial for higher L above some threshold. And so taking L equals zero, 
is the sort of maximally hard case to prove the things I'm trying to prove. And it's also just simpler to, uh, to consider. But mostly, the Ronsky index doesn't actually appear in the calculations I'll do. Um, so I'm not sure I had to say that, but technically I did. So, um, so the answer I was is trying that, to understand if if this if there's always for every chiral character an equation with L equals zero. Or... Oh, uh, no, no. Um, oh, okay. But for those where there aren't, what I'm going to say still holds, but it just becomes obvious. Um, oh, okay. I'll, I'll return to that in just a second. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so there's been there's a whole uh, kind of um, industry of studying these MDEs for low values of D and completely classifying the solutions, which look like uh, CFT characters. Um, and by that, I mean, they have integral uh, positive Fourier coefficients. Um, and in that realm, but usually the, the classification proceeds by, uh, you know, is ordered in terms of D and L. So, um, uh, but even for D equals three, there's not a full classification of these of character type solutions. Why, if I, if you give me a factor value modular form, is is it always true that its components are solutions to these IDEs? Yes. But why is that true? You stated here, but is there? Can you give me a, at least a little bit of in, intuition why this is true? Uh, let's see. So, can I? Um, well, so the, the components altogether form, it furnishes this representation, right? Um, and each of these terms, th this whole object here transforms with um, a, a uniform weight. So um, it, this is a, a well-defined enough modular object that just by the vir by virtue of having written it down, it defines some representation of SL2Z. And the only thing you have to care about when you write down the equation as to whether it defines a VVMF as opposed to something more exotic, like something with logs, is whether the parameters in the VVMF, in the MDE rather, um, don't have, don't, are not suitably degenerate. But if they're not, then you'll get a VVMF out and then the arrow runs in reverse just by way of the sort of mild structure that one is assuming here, just that there is some representation of SL2Z, which is realized by this, this vector. And this object here uh, is built out of modular <clears throat> covariant objects and transforms uniformly. That's always how I thought about it. They might not be sufficient to actually get you Can there. I ask a somewhat related question? Yeah. So I know sort of examples where the one can interpret this differential operator in terms of the insertion of the zero mode of some chiral operator in the CFT, mm -hmm. right? Because rational CFTs have null states. And so that means that there must be some chiral operator whose insertion <clears throat> of the partition function gives you zero. Yes. Is it known or believed to be true that one can always interpret this differential operator as coming from the insertion of <clears throat> You know, like the, the example that I know is like in the Li-Yang theory, if you insert one of these KDV charges, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. this gives you a differential operator that annihilates all the characters. But is that a general yeah. thing that's believed to always be true? Or so is I, that only, um, am I being misled by examples? Sorry. No, no, this is a good question. And I'm not, I, I don't know the full answer. There are different answers depending on level of rigor one wants. Um, <clears throat> there was a paper uh, 2008 or nine or so by uh, Gabriel yeah. and Keller, which made right. an argument that in the, in the CFT context, invoking some structure that exists there, this is always the case and the null state is in the vacuum module. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe when you get into the details about whether you're talking about a VOA and what kinds of constraints it satisfies, um, it may not always be the case that one can show all equations coming from a null state, but uh, in my experience, I thought that it was believed that that is true. Okay, I don't know perfect. if Chris Beam is here. He's thought about these things. Maybe he can give a more refined answer. Thanks. Sure. Okay. So, good. <clears throat>
So these things we can develop a Fourier series, which in general looks like this. There's some leading exponent m naught of i. I indexes the component. And there's some coefficients. And uh, then the expansion proceeds in some powers of q. <clears throat> um, for the partition function case, these coefficients here are rational numbers. right? They're just hi minus c over 24. Now, an important fact about these things is that the initial equation <clears throat> implies a universal property of the VVMF. If you add up all the leading exponents, you get d d minus 1 over 12. Um, this is not too hard to show from the MVE. And if you have this non-zero Ronskian index L from the right-hand side of this changes, it goes down. Um, that's just an aside. And so what we're going to do is consider the quantity m naught, which we'd find to be the minimum of all these leading exponents. From the introduction, you might infer that what we're interested in is how whether m naught is bounded. And you see from this equation that in principle, m naught can be positive or negative a priori. Now, enter integrality. There's a mathematical conjecture about the implications of integrality, which is sometimes called the unbounded denominator conjecture in the math community, but uh, has been referred to as the integrality conjecture, say in papers by Banta and Gannon. And that's what I'll call it here, which is the following. So assume these leading exponents are rational. If there exists some integer m, such that all entries of m times the VVMF have integral Fourier coefficients, then all the components are modular functions for gamma n, which is a subgroup of SL2z, which, uh, uh, for which the matrices are equal to the identity mod n. So this multiplying by n just means clear the denominators. If you can do this in a finite way, then we call this integral. This is the kind of object that would be a character in a uh, CFT. Uh, in the math world, this is proven for low dimensions and widely held to be true in general. And I believe it's been proven using modular tensor category technology. And we're going to take it as a given um, because it's something we're going to want to uh, invoke as we impose integrality on our VVMFs in the CFT context. So using that, we can prove the following result. So I'm going to state this mathematically, and then we'll do the physics after. So if we have some SL2Z invariant function f with this kind of Fourier expansion, if f is a gluing of VVMFs of dimension greater than 1 with rational leading uh, uh, powers, then if we impose integrality, m0 is negative. And likewise for m0 bar. So the proof is simple, um, and it's got a physics flavor to it. Let me um, let me just go through it quickly. So, so first, we prove this following sub theorem. So if we have some VVMF uh, with components V sub i, where the leading exponent is m naught i, OK? If we holomorphic means it's allowed to have poles. Uh, if there's one component, which is a modular function for gamma n, and has a non-zero leading exponent, then m naught is negative. In other words, one of the components of this VVMF has a negative leading exponent. And so what's the proof? Well, Modular functions for this subgroup, gamma n, obey what's called a valence formula, which is that if you add up all the orders of the poles or zeros everywhere in the fundamental domain, then they must equal zero. And this zero here is the weight zero. And everywhere in this talk, I'm considering vector value modular forms of modular weight zero, because I'm trying to make partition functions out of them. Okay. Now, if we assume that there's one component where the leading exponent is positive, and hence it dies at the cusp at infinity, then the valence formula implies that this diverges somewhere else because we have to add something to that to make zero. Okay. Now, if we form the SL2Z invariant object by squaring V, just taking the diagonal invariant, then because all cusps can be mapped to infinity by an SL2Z transformation, there's some other component which diverges at infinity because this component V sub i diverged at a cusp. And there's some frame where you can map that divergence at zero up to infinity uh, in a modular invariant way for this object f. And that's the proof. So here's a picture. Uh, this is the example of gamma 2. Here's the fundamental domain. And here are these equations here, just to remind. So if we have some component which has a zero up at infinity, then by the initial equation, it has to have a pole at one of these cusps. But then we do an SL2Z transformation. f stays invariant. And that means that in this other frame, there must be some other component which has a pole up here, 
And that means that there's some negative exponent somewhere else in this vector. And that's what we want to show. Now, finally, combining this with the integrality conjecture gets us where we want to get, because in the previous theorem, we assumed there was one component which was modular for this subgroup. And so now the integrality conjecture says, well, uh, integrality implies that there is such a component. Okay, so, so we've shown that integrality of VVMFs tells you that there is some negative leading exponent uh, in an SL2Z invariant function like this. So now let's get some physics out of this. So we're going to take F to be different observables in the torus and ask, ask what happens. So here's a warm up. Sorry, Gary. Yes, you, please. You really mean negative or just non positive? Can it be non positive? Um, so this is where the, I mean negative, but I think the D greater than one is taking care of that. Um, you can have, so one DVVMF, you know, a constant is a one DVVMF. Um, and you can get around this by considering the one dimensional case, but I do mean negative, yes. Okay, thanks. Sure. Okay. So if we take F to be a partition function, well, the leading behavior near the cusp is this. Um, in a unitary CFT, C effective is always positive. In the virus or minimal models, it's also always non-negative. Um, now, applying a previous theorem, what we've shown is that all rational CFTs have a non-negative C effective, okay, a rather positive C effective. I, I'm saying non-negative here because we excluded D equals one, but you can have D equals one sometimes. So I'm including it when I talk about the, the physics application, I'm trying to be careful about that. So this, I call this a warm up because we're uh, sort of reproducing these facts on general grounds. Where this is non-trivial is for non-unitary rational CFTs, which are in general unclassified. Okay, things get more interesting when you start taking differences of partition functions. And let me emphasize again, you're allowed to do this because I'm not using positivity. So let's take two rational CFTs with the same central charge and the same chiral algebra. Okay, so they have the same uh, VVMFs, just different gluing matrices. This follows from some work of Moore and Cyber. Okay. So F being the difference of the two is now a gluing of VV VVMFs now with reduced dimensionality because some of the states are the same between the two, like the vacuum, because I said the central charge is the same, but other states will be paired differently. And F is modular invariant, so it takes this form of VVMFs on the left and right glued together by some gluing matrix. Now, if these two rational CFTs have identical spectra with twists less than or equal to C over 12, that is to say, if all of their terms with non-positive powers are the same, then by our previous result, this form F is trivial, which is to say that the twist spectrum of twists above C over 12 is uniquely determined by its complement. There's a corollary to this, which is that there's at most one RCFT partition function with a given chiral algebra, a given central charge, and twist gap greater than C over 12. So in other words, rational CFTs obey twist determinacy. You fix the twists down here, and that determines the twists up here. Uh, just a couple comments. Um, Moren Cyber taught us you should always work with the extended chiral algebra, and then the gluing matrix is just going to be a permutation matrix. And so one way to interpret this result is that the chiral algebra automorphisms always permute, permute some field with twists less than or equal to C over 12. Uh, this may be known, but I suppose not because it, uh, you know, the classification of these invariants is far from being done because, I mean, the classification of all algebras is also not done. So um, this is very much uh, an open problem in the abstract. Uh, and referring back to the comment I made before, the equals uh, in this in this result here. I didn't um, understand the comment. So, sorry, say again? I didn't understand this comment. There are many examples where the gluing matrix is not zeros or ones. But that means you're not working with the fully extended algebra, doesn't it? I don't know if it's proven, but okay. I thought they proved it in this naturality and CFT paper. I thought that was the, yeah. So, so in this whole discussion, I'm, the VVMF is, um, uh, you know, with respect to the maximal chiral algebra. Yeah, yeah thanks. 
Um, good. And so the equals allows for the D equals one VVMS. So indeed, whenever you only permit, permute two states, the difference between the two partition functions is, you know, the, the gluing matrix is one minus one minus one one. So it takes this form and you can view this as a 1D VVMF, which is just the difference of the two. And there are well-known cases where F happens to be just a constant, which is a 1D VVMF. And so that could only have happened, um, you know, a constant has twist exactly C over 12. So um, that jibes with what we're, what we're saying here. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so let's get a little bit more out of this VVMF result before moving on to, to modularity. So now let's take F to be equal to a torus one point function of some operator O. And if we dress it by eta functions, then this is modular invariant. Technically, there might be a multiplier if HO and H bar O don't differ by a, mod, uh, a multiple of 12, but that's not, not relevant for what we're going to say ultimately. In this context, what are the VVMF components? Well, they're uh, dressed torus one point blocks. So F is a torus one point block and the gluing matrix is the matrix of OP coefficients. Um, and of course it's diagonal because we're looking at a one point function. Now, if one point blocks are ever integral, we can apply our previous results. They have to be integral because we applied integrality and previously we were talking about characters and now we're talking about conformal blocks. This is very much non-trivial. But if the blocks are ever integral, we can apply our previous result to this question. If you have some O appearing in an OPE of phi and phi dagger, what is the upper bound T star of the lowest twist phi in whose OPE O appears? So I have not found a non-clumsy way to, to state this, <laughs> this question, but it's sort of the converse of the usual question that is asked in the context of bootstrapping four-point functions. <clears throat> now, there are many specific cases of rational CFTs where the blocks happen to be integral. Um, you can find some in our paper and some work by Miranda Chang et al, uh, for example, um, and a nice paper by Gabriel Dion Lang. But what we're interested in are cases when the blocks are integral in general rational CFTs because we're trying to make a robust bootstrap statement. <clears throat> now, if you have experience with, with Torres one-point blocks or Sphere four-point blocks, you might be surprised to learn that there is actually one non-trivial case where this happens for arbitrary central charge and arbitrary internal operator phi. And that is when the external operator O has chiral dimension one. This is something that was uh, nicely laid out in a paper Alex wrote with Per Krauss, uh, uh, known, but they, they sort of stated the argument nicely, which is that when you integrate this operator over the circle, it becomes weight zero. Um, and so you just recover the character, that is to say the trace over the module of phi of q to the L naught minus C over 24. Right, so the one point function is, is translation invariant, you integrate it, you get something with zero, this is just the character times a number. And of course a character is positive and integral. <clears throat> so what should we do with this? Well, the interesting case of course is when O is a marginal scalar, so then H and H bar are both one. And if O is exactly marginal or even just one loop marginal, then the three point function of O or O dagger vanishes. And so we have a bootstrap bound. Any rational CFT with an exactly marginal operator O with a non-zero one point function must have a primary phi not equal to O on account of this condition, which satisfies this bound here. Moreover, the OPE coefficients of the twists below T star uniquely determine the complement. So the plus two here comes from this dressing by eta's where you plug in h equals one, uh, but that's the result. So this is a result about rational points on conformal manifolds, just about being at the rational point. Let's make a couple of comments about this. <clears throat> I'm gonna emphasize again, um, uh, we don't have positivity, but the virtue of working with torus one point functions is that this operator phi star is necessarily, uh, or phi rather, is necessarily non holomorphic because the vacuum module does not contribute to torus one point functions. Traditionally, non positivity is an issue, but what we're showing here is that discreteness and integrality, and modularity, of course, are enough in the rational context to get a bound. Notice that we're using integrality of the blocks, but we get a result for the OPE coefficients. 
right? The gluing matrix here, which is comprised of the OP coefficients, is, is we're showing that the components above some threshold are fixed by those below. But all we needed was that the blocks that we're gluing together obey this integrality property. And finally, in conformal perturbation theory, the one point function, or rather the three point function, O phi phi dagger, is linearly related to the first order anomalous dimension of this operator phi. And so you can think of this as a constraint on conformal perturbation theory, where this operator phi that must exist in the theory is the lowest twist primary with a first order anomalous dimension. Now, it turns out that it's actually not that hard to get a bound on delta. This will be the first step toward segueing to the modularity segment. Um, you know, we've been talking about twist previously because we're constraining the chiral half of these objects, or we're constraining the VVMFs, which are holomorphic, and then we're asking what happens when we glue them together. But in the rational setting, um, you can prove a result for, for delta, which is this. It looks just like the one before, except you just have a shift of the bound by this quantity. And this quantity is basically the maximum um, gluing matrix, which glues you know, lowest dimension operators on one side with the highest dimension operator on the other, so as to maximize the gap. Um, I didn't go through this because it's fairly straightforward if you have the technology in place, um, but it's of a fundamentally different nature because we're bounding delta, not, not twist. Okay. This just follows pretty quickly from the VVMF initial equation. Um, an interesting thing about this is that D here is the dimension of the VV, VVMF appearing. So what is D when we're talking about a one-point function? It's the number of operators phi in whose OPE this operator O appears. And since O is exactly marginal, D is telling us the rank of the one-loop dilatation matrix in perturbations around this, this point. And so this bound is kind of interesting. On the right-hand side, you have the rank of this matrix here. And on the left, you have the dimension of the lightest operator, which gets lifted at first order. I don't really understand fundamentally why these two things are related in this way, but I find it interesting. I think it's worth thinking about more. Um, before moving on, let's make a comment that maybe has occurred to those of us who like to think about large C. Let's take the large C limit holding, say, D sub O fixed. This bound asymptotes to C over 12. And we all like that, but let's be careful. This is a statement about rational CFTs. So to preserve rationality, we have to take the chiral algebra to be large. What this means is that you have to take the number of currents to be large, always less than or equal to C. So if we're taking a large C limit, we are making a statement about a rational CFT with an infinite number of currents in the large C limit. But because this bound constrains the non-holomorphic sector of the theory, we're getting something non-trivial, right? All the currents sort of come along for the ride, but we're making a bound on the rest of the theory. And this theory is irrational with respect to Vera Soro. So it's kind of in this in-between realm of trying to prove the modular bootstrap bound that we all want to prove for Vera Soro CFTs and something that is totally trivial about rational theories. It's somewhere in the middle. Holographically, what do we have in the bulk? Well, we have the massless scalar dual to O, we have all of these extra currents, which are required to maintain rationality. But in such a theory, what this bound is showing is that uh, there is a black hole, which exists right where you might expect uh, at the BTZ threshold that arises in semi classical gravity. So I like this result because it's sort of stepping back from the most ambitious problem in a way where you can actually analytically prove a bound. It'd be nice to show that it's optimal, um, but I won't do that today. So let me ask if there are questions um, before proceeding. OK. Um, can I also have uh, a, a, what time is it? Well, you're, you're doing pretty well on time, so. OK, thanks. It's uh, five. <laughs> 540. All right, good. Thanks. Yeah, my, my presentation hid the clock and I did not <clears throat> I didn't anticipate that. Okay, good. All right. So before moving on to the second part of the talk about this newer work, um, let's let's segue smoothly to to the um, to the realm of generic CFTs. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> so let's back off from rational CFTs and vector valued modular forms for a second. <clears throat> and ponder the question about spectral determinacy in delta, not in twist. <clears throat> Mathematically, this translates to the question of whether there exist suitable modular invariant functions whose Fourier series have support only above some cutoff x naught. Okay, so if we look at some function f on the diagonal, where tau bar equals minus tau, <clears throat> excuse me, then if the Fourier series starts with a q to the x naught, we want to know whether um, there is spectral determinacy for some x naught, right? And, and one way to understand that is whether there exist modular functions which have support only above some cutoff such that when you add them to a putative partition function, they change those degeneracies. But if those functions exist, then spectral determinacy does not hold. If f is a partition function of a CFT, then x naught is delta minus c over 12, of course. And so the natural cutoff to ask about is whether there exist functions which have support only above x naught equals zero. Right. This is natural from a 3D gravity perspective. It's what happens in, it's the interesting threshold in holomorphic CFTs, and we just saw this, this twist determinacy result in rational CFTs. So what we want to know are whether there are uh, functions which have support on just positive powers of Q and a discrete um, and perhaps positive Fourier expansion. And that's what this asterisk next to suitable is meant to indicate. What we want for our application is a function that has those physical properties too. So asking the most that you can ask for uh, turns out to be too much. So it's easy to show that there do not exist cuspidal non-holomorphic modular forms satisfying positivity, discreteness, and integrality. I'm afraid I did not define cuspidal. Cuspidal means that it starts with a positive power of Q. In other words, it vanishes at the cusp of infinity. Sorry. So what's the proof? Well, that's pretty quick. So first, we're going to insist that this function has a discrete expansion. So it's just a, a Q series. Now, by construction, this function vanishes at infinity as Q goes to 0. But it's also modular invariant. And in particular, it's S invariant, which means that it vanishes at the origin, where Q goes to 1. So now we have a constraint that a sum of these degeneracies must equal 0. But of course, if they're all positive, that can't happen. Uh, and that's it. Note that if we allow negativity, then integrality implies that there must be an infinite number of negative coefficients. So you can satisfy it, but you have to have an infinite number of negative uh, quote unquote degeneracies in this function in order for that to work. And discreteness was crucial here. So if these coefficients actually could depend on the modular, the imaginary part of tau, um, so you had some sum like this, and you're evaluating this as y goes to 0, which is down on the real line, the modular image of the cusp, then this can be satisfied regardless of what the degeneracies are uh, if you have some you know, positive powers of y weighting the different terms. So this is kind of a nice setting where discreteness and integrality give you a quick result. Uh, and without them, you, you have no result. Now, if you drop positivity, you can find cuspidal functions that are discrete and integral, but I won't talk about that here. I thought in a physical setting, these a's were supposed to be integers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But how can you have the sum of all the a's being convergent if you have infinitely many integers? Should you, in other words, do you have convergence at q equals zero that allows you to write such a simple thing that sum of a x equals zero? Uh, I think uh, not literally, but uh, certainly if they're all um, positive, then S invariance rules that out. Right. Um, so I don't think this is well, even literally right. Can sum to minus 1 over 12, if I, right? Yes. A sum of positive integers. So yes. if the left hand side does not converge, then what does this equation mean? Uh, yeah, so, so I think this can be made precise using these Tiberian Cardi type techniques, um, where the statement is that, so, so, you know, there, so if you don't have, if you don't have any states of, of, of negative weight, then the asymptotic density of states is much better behaved. So I think this is more convergent than you're used to. Uh -huh. 
So, so I, I'm not sure if this literally holds. I don't think it does. But if, but you, you, um, you need not be worried about, um, you know, a Cardi density or even a polynomial density, because, um, you know, in that language, those asymptotics arise from the fact that you had some negative weight states, and the modular images gave you this this growth, which was required to reproduce the divergence. Here, by construction, this thing vanishes at infinity. So I'd have to think a little more carefully about the exact way to phrase this, but um, uh, I, I, I think this is true. I'm not presenting it very precisely here. This is a bit of a sketch. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so, so that, that was slightly an aside. Um, perhaps I should have omitted it, but what we want to do is understand modularity constraints more systematically, and, and let's just forget about the spectral determinacy and circle back to that later. Okay, so when we write the partition function like this, modular invariance is, of course, um, yeah, hard to, to see through to. Um, but what we're going to do is make um, use of these mathematical techniques of harmonic analysis uh, for SL2Z, whereby any function which is square integrable on the fundamental domain can be expanded in the basis of manifestly modular invariant functions. And what we're going to do is try to apply this to CFTs. It's not completely straightforward because the word square integrable, but we're in that sentence, and that's something we're going to have to deal with. But in dealing with that, we'll find some, some interesting lessons. <clears throat> OK. So here is a bit of a shot sheet on that. All right, so if you have some square integrable function f, where uh, the norm is taken to be the Peterson norm, which uses the Poincaré metric. Um, then these functions admit a spectral decomposition into the following basis. There's a continuous piece and a discrete piece. Let's talk about the continuous piece first. These are comprised of real analytic Eisenstein series with index s equals a half minus i times a real number. So the Eisenstein series are eigenfunctions of the Laplacian on uh, upper half space. They have a Fourier series, which is well known. These beta and b are totally determined. They're given by number theoretic quantities like divisors and zetas, etc. And the Eisenstein series also admits a Poincaré series as a sum over the imaginary part of tau to the s, where s is the index. I remind you of these things. You may well know them. These objects appear frequently in, in HEPTH. On the other hand, the discrete objects are a bit less familiar. Certainly, they were to me. Uh, these new ends are uh, known as mass cusp forms, or just cusp forms for short. There's a constant one. The n equals 0 is a constant. But uh, for n greater than or equal to 0, they're indexed by integers. There's an infinite number of them. Uh, they, too, are eigenfunctions of this Laplacian. Um, but the eigenvalues, uh, and likewise, the Fourier coefficients in the decomposition are not known in closed form, even for a single cusp form. There is a lot of numerical data on these. And from what I gather, this is a rich area of mathematics. Here I'm just showing a snapshot of some of the low-lying cusp forms. So Rn is like the real number over here. Um, Here's some data, right? There's the Rn's. And the A's are the Fourier coefficients here. Uh, in a normalization, which is conventional for mathematicians, uh, for reasons I won't really explain, uh, which is that the spin 1 coefficient is normalized to 1. So you see these are numbers, great. Um, they're real numbers. And so at this level, these two pieces of the decomposition look rather similar. Fourier expansions, it just so happens that over here, the parameter is continuous, and over here it's discrete. And the Fourier coefficients here are some object, and over here is just some random numbers. But um, OK, they're not so different. But there are important differences. <clears throat> For our purposes, probably the most important is that while the Eisenstein series have a scalar component, by that I mean in physics terms, the j equals 0 piece of the Fourier expansion, at which there's a power law divergence at the cusp as y goes to infinity, the cusp forms have no scalar component. And moreover, they die exponentially at the cusp, because r is a real number, and the Bessel function behaves uh, that way. 
That's why they're called cusp forms, because they die at the cusp. This is not exactly the same as the terminology I used before, cuspidal functions, which also die at the cusp. Uh, but let's, but unfortunately, these are two different terms that exist in the literature. But we can ignore the word cuspidal for the rest of the talk. And when I say cusp form, I mean one of these discrete guys here. Okay. So that's one difference that you should bear in mind. Um, when you decompose a function that is not in L2, but is almost in L2, uh, there are ways to deal with that. So Zagier in particular had a paper where he modifies the traditional decomposition to include um, terms of what he calls slow growth, where their norms diverge polynomially or perhaps logarithmically. In this case, you modify your function f a little bit uh, in a way which he prescribes. And the upshot is that you add to this decomposition some Eisenstein series or perhaps the derivatives which have real index. So you can see that this, something like this is necessary. Morally, what's happening is that if you have some function which at the cusp diverges like a power law, you sort of subtract it out and add it in a modular invariant way uh, where Eisenstein with index s has a divergence at the cusp, like y to the s. And finally, and I really won't have much to say about this, but these data here are, are not completely random numbers. They exhibit what's known as arithmetic chaos, um, a concept which is related to the fact that these cusp forms describe the spectrum of uh, quantum mechanics and negatively curved space, like the upper half uh, like the fundamental domain of SL2Z. And there's lots of interesting stuff here, which I'm just beginning to understand and would like to think about more in terms of the physics, but I won't have much to say about this today. <clears throat> okay. So what we want to do is decompose the primary partition function of generic CFTs, by which I mean those with Virasoro symmetry only, and C greater than one. So let's define the primary partition function ZP like so. Now, there's an immediate obstruction, which is that this is not square integrable due to the identity operator. Indeed, any light primary gives a divergence at the cusp at infinity, which is exponential. If we define the partition sum over light primary Z sub L as follows, then we restrict to all states where H plus H bar is bounded above by C minus one over 12. And the identity and any other light operators violate square integrability due to the divergences of the cusp. <clears throat> this is not special to Virasoro, right? Any partition function of a CFT with some chiral algebra A will, at leading order um, near the cusp, diverge like Q to the minus C minus C currents over 12, where C currents is the effective central charge of the vacuum module. And in an irrational CFT, irrational with respect to A, that's just equal to n currents, the number of currents of the, of the algebra. And there's some power law here, which is subleading. So we have a problem, it seems. <clears throat> now, the first thing to do is to ignore the problem. So you might notice that if we take CFTs with central charge equal to C currents, uh, which one might say are perched on the edge of irrationality, then this problem is easier to deal with because the vacuum contributes only a power law divergence. And as we said before, this type of divergence can be handled by traditional spectral methods. In the paper, we study the Narain CFTs in some detail. Um, and this is a little bit askew from the main thread of this talk, so I won't go into a lot of detail about the calculations. But I think it should be clear at this point that these partition functions are amenable to calculation more than the generic CFT partition function. Precisely because at the cusp, you just have a power law divergence rather than an exponential divergence because these theories all have C equal to C currents. So what do we do in the paper? Well, there's uh, quite a bit that gets done there. Um, I've mentioned a couple of things here. Uh, and I think the structure of Narain CFTs is um, somewhat elucidated by our calculations. And there's a lot more to understand in this language. Here I just quote the structure of the spectral decomposition for arbitrary C, um, not because I want to explain it, but just because I want to point out, here's the continuous piece. You have some, some moduli M and there's some integral over the Eisenstein piece times some, some kernel, which we determine the general structure of for arbitrary central charge. There's the cusp form piece, 
whose overlap in some cases we determine exactly. There's a constant piece in tau. And then there's this Eisenstein piece here, which comes from the uh, regularization of the vacuum divergence at infinity. <clears throat> but this doesn't help us with the problem we really wanted to solve uh, in the first place here, which was that generic CFTs seem not to admit a spectral decomposition. But with some lessons learned from, from those calculations, we want to view the problem a little bit differently. And so let me encourage you to think about it this way. You have some partition function. It has some light operators. Subtract them off in a modular invariant way to define something we call Z spec. So this object Z light hat is what we call the modular completion of Z light. So what that means is that first of all, it's modular invariant. And second of all, it differs from Z light only on heavy states. So given some primary spectrum, collect all the light states, modular complete them, and then subtract it from the primary partition function. Then you're left with what we call Z spec. And this thing by construction okay. is square integrable. It's obvious that this ZL hat exists. So how do you get it? It should perform an infinite sum would. Uh... Uh, good. Yeah, so, so it exists in that for finite C, there's always only a, a, a finite number of light operators. So the infinite sum is not over an infinite number of light operators. Yeah. Uh, sorry. So set hat exists, I guess, is the question. Not yeah, yeah. Out. I was just wondering that this operation of modular completion, uh, I'm worried if it's uh, guaranteed to give you a convergent object. So at finite central charge, um, OK, so which, which so as I'll, as I'll talk about a little bit later, um, modular completion is not unique. Um, and perhaps we can revisit this topic when I mention that. Okay. But uh, there are, I think, more and less well-defined ways of modular completing. But for every, you have a finite number of operators for which you have to do this. And so um, uh, at finite C, there's not an issue in, in the sum of our operators. So if you pick a modular completion, which makes, which makes sense for an individual operator, it will make sense for the full Z hat L. Great. Good. So, by construction, this object Z spec is square integrable. We've subtracted out all the pieces that are not in a modular invariant way. And so it admits a bona fide spectral decomposition. <clears throat> From this, a spectral determinacy result follows immediately. So what's the result? The result is that the entire spectrum of a 2D CFT is uniquely fixed by the light spectrum, the scalar spectrum, and the spin one spectrum, as pictured before and, and shown again here. So here are the instructions to reconstruct the full spectrum. Take your partition function. Given the light spectrum, form Z spec. Then the scalar spectrum of Z spec fixes the overlap with the Eisenstein series. And it does so because the cusp forms have no scalar support. So knowing the scalar spectrum, you determine this overlap. There are ways to do this, which I haven't discussed, which were explicit about in the paper. And then by inserting the Fourier uh, decomposition of the Eisenstein series, you determine all the higher spin data uh, from the Eisenstein part of Z spec. <clears throat> What's left is to determine the cusp form part. And so uh, after subtracting the spin one piece from the Eisensteins, you just determine this overlap by, by inversion. And uh, since we know that the Fourier expansion of the cusp forms has this Bessel form, uh, this can be done explicitly. And so using the spin one data to do this then gives you that overlap. And therefore you've determined all of the pieces of the spectral decomposition and therefore in principle, the full spectrum. So that's the argument. I should note that <clears throat> subject to a minor assumption, you can replace- Eric, can problem. you be a bit more specific? How did you determine uh, the point three? Uh, why was J yeah. one spectrum sufficient for that? Good. So, so um, let, let's let's look at, at this. Okay. So, so we have these two pieces that we need to determine. Yeah. Once we fix the overlaps, we have the whole thing, right? So, so our job is to fix these two pieces of data. This one has no support on spin zero. So 
use the spin zero spectrum, which you assume you know, to fix this, then this part's done. <clears throat> this will give a spin one contribution, but subtract this from the spin one contribution over here that you know, and what you're left with is this piece here, and then you can compute the overlap uh, uh, by equating those two. And my comment about the Fourier expansion was, we know that the cusp forms take the form of the sum over vessels. And so if you take spin one, you just have to invert this vessel function to extract the overlap and, and that can be done. It just somehow, yeah. Uh, okay, I'll have to think more about it. So it's just somehow you're saying that if F has no spin zero and spin one, support then then f is zero that in particular follows from what you said yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because if it has no spin zero uh, yeah. okay at this point it's, it's maybe worth making a remark that you you look you might look at this and say I don't see a CFT spectrum in there. After all, I thought we were talking about discrete spectra of unitary CFTs. And we are. But in order to access the spectrum in the old form of you know, Q series, some over characters, the contour deformation may be needed. And so these overlaps have a certain pole structure. And they must have a certain pole structure in order that such a contour deformation recovers the discrete spectrum of a compact CFT. We've not used discreteness here. And in the free boson cases we study in the paper, we work this out, um, confirming that given the overlaps one computes from the explicit partition function, you can reproduce the known spectrum using this technology. Um, but it's an interesting question to ask what kind of constraints these overlaps must obey in a general theory, such that uh, you can actually recover a discrete rather than continuous spectrum from this procedure. Okay. Eric, another yes. question here. So yeah. Z spec was not unique because of this modular completion procedure, but is the claim yeah. that any completion will give the same answer here and, and so that the final answer is unique? Um, yeah, because Z hat is not, Z spec is not unique just on account of Z hat not being unique. So, um, you know, you will change the, um, so, sorry. Um, is that what you're asking? Um, um, I'm, when you change modular completion, or just procedures to, to define Z spec, mm -hmm. allow me to, to evade your uh, determinancy answer or determinancy claim or not? No, I think that just shuffles different pieces around. Um, I see. Okay. Yeah. Ah, good, okay. Um, right, so I just made this comment about discreteness. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So th there are some arguments that, that I, I personally think are pretty compelling that once you impose discreteness and ideally integrality, you might not even need the spin one and spin zero data as extra data. Um, morally, the reason is that to recover a discrete spectrum um, from something like the infinite sum of cusp forms, uh, you need a kind of conspiracy or a fine tuning. And a similar argument holds for, for the scalar case. So I can be a little more specific, right? If, if you have two theories where the scalar spectrum matches, then um, let's see, what slide am I looking for here? Let's look here. Then when you take the difference, uh, if it's a compact theory, then the spin one spectrum must be completely determined by the difference of the cusp form contributions. But these cusp forms are rather chaotic objects. And you might not believe that this infinite sum of these chaotic things, um, which individually have continuous Fourier expansions, can give you a discrete expansion. Um, that is, at this point, just speculation. It would be nice to make that precise. Uh, and I should also just remark for the bootstrap community at large here that 
this has a similar spirit as some of what we know about CFT register trajectories in D dimensions. We know from, from analyticity and spin that one cannot just tweak OPE data at will. What we're seeing here is, is a slightly stronger or more specific result at any rate, which is that once you take care of the light operators, if you have the low spin data, that fixes the rest of the data. So there's a determinism here, which operates in 2D, which would be very nice to understand from a different point of view, say that of regular theory. So transitioning now to the more general interpretation of what this all is supposed to mean, uh, and then I'll conclude. Um, the way we think about this, or the way I think about this, uh, and you, you are free to, to think about it your own way, and I think there's some um, some more to be learned from this whole toolkit is that Z-spec is computing for us a kind of deviation of a partition function from an average or universal contribution from the existence of light states. So given some partition function with some light spectrum, Z hat is computing a universal piece of the full spectrum. And what Z-spec computes for you is the deviation of the actual instance of the CFT in your hand from that universality. This interpretation gets its strongest support, I would say, from the Naran result, which we worked out in the paper and which I flashed earlier. Let's write it like this. So the primary partition function of the Naran theory at central charge C, an individual Naran theory, is equal to, as you might recall, the Eisenstein series with index C over two, plus some stuff, and that stuff had the form of a spectral decomposition. So I'm going to call it Z spec here. It literally is the spectral decomposition of the piece of the partition function, which uh, decays at infinity uh, in, the, in the manner required for a spectral decomposition to hold. That is to say, in order to be square into the rule. Uh, last year, the ensemble average of, of these theories was computed from first principles, and it's exactly equal to this Eisenstein series. That is to say, Z spec averages to zero. But from our point of view, this Eisenstein series arises as the modular completion of the vacuum state, in this case by Poincare sum. So, what we found is that the average of the partition function of these free boson CFTs equals the modular completion of the vacuum state, which is exactly this interpretation that we're making here. It's not trivial from this point of view, but it is the Poincaré sum of the vacuum state. And so there's a kind of interesting synergy between the fact that this averaging was done with respect to the Zemlogikov measure on moduli space on the one hand, and the fact that uh, the modular completion of the vacuum state is done by a Poincaré sum on the other. So these two things sort of fit nicely together, and they suggest that Poincaré sums are, at least in some sense, a nice choice of modular completion. For general Viosoro CFTs, of course, we don't know what it means to average over theories yet, um, or whether that will ever be given uh, a rigorous definition in the sense that we want it. But you know, words are words, and we can perhaps one day understand what it means to average over theories. But until then, the interpretation of the Z hat that makes the most sense is the one of universality. So to motivate this more than uh, uh, I did using the Narain state uh, story, if we modular complete our light states by Poincaré sum, one for each light state, then in a holographic context, Poincaré sums are well known to capture semi-classical expansions of gravity path integrals, uh, at least in an expansion in small g Newton, that is to say one over C. So the way we're interpreting Z hat guided by this, which is especially sensible at large C, I would say, is as a kind of universal contribution of the light fields to the microcanonical entropy of black holes in the bulk um, in the same way that the Poincaré sums have been seen to do this in the past. Now, it's important to note that the Poincaré sum is not the unique modular completion. Um, we don't know one that uh, makes discreteness explicit. Indeed, what, is a what, what does the Poincaré sum look like? Given some light state, the Poincaré sum uh, spits out that light state plus a continuum of heavy states. So a nice thing about it is that it doesn't add for you any spurious light states that you must then subtract in some other modular completion. Uh, but 
it is continuous on the heavy spectrum. That's not a problem per se, because ZP in a compact CFT is the thing that has to be discrete. This can be continuous, and that just means Z spec will be continuous. And indeed, when you give a spectral decomposition, uh, it's in terms of these basis functions, which themselves are continuous. So this is not violating any principle. Um, the important point to make is that there may be other modular completions which have different physical features, which are worth uh, exploring. But we don't know of any that are sort of nicer in a global way than the, than the, the ones that we're, we're exploring here. Now, as a final slide, I should say this viewpoint has limitations. When we say this captures universality, not all universal aspects of 2D CFT spectra that are known are captured. And in particular, since spectral decomposition is a statement that relies on square integrability of the object in question, and that in turn depends on the behavior near the cusp, this is sensitive to the dimensions delta, but not the twist. Because near the cusp, partition function expansions are ordered uh, by powers of dimension. Right? And so there may well be some more refined uh, data about 2D CFT spectra in the twist sector, which are not captured by what we mean by universal here. But uh, I think there's a lot of interesting physics that is captured, and it'd be nice to make uh, extensions of this. Maybe there's some idea of ensemble averaging for Viosoro CFTs that we want to, to cook up. Um, I think this construction inspires us to find one for which this object Z spec averages to zero, exactly like what happened in the Narain case. Um, and as a last speculation, which I'll just essentially skip because uh, I feel I'm over time, um, in the paper we remark that Z spec is a kind of natural analog in 2D of these half wormholes that Saad Shanker Stanford and Yao found in the JT gravity story. Why are they a natural analog? Because as I've tried to argue, this object captures a kind of noise above the universal properties of the partition function due to the existence of light states. And so in this sense, it is a, um, a fluctuating object which sees subleading features of the theory, uh, for example, its chaotic behavior. And that's definitely something that would be nice to make more explicit. Um, I refer you to the paper for slightly more elaborate remarks and, and some possible calculations we propose in the Narain context that could get at that. <clears throat> so um, that's all. There are several future directions. I think the main one in my mind is to try to combine what we've learned about discreteness and integrality with what we've learned about modularity. And in particular, in the spectral decomposition story, discreteness was not imposed. And if we can understand what requiring discreteness of these partition functions um, imposes on, on the objects appearing in the spectral decomposition, I think we'd be halfway towards some kind of formulation of the modular bootstrap, which looks very different from the one that we're used to doing. Uh, so I'll just stop there. Thanks. Yeah, Eric, I I'm afraid that I missed this. Still would like to ask a question about this J equals J equals sure. because I, uh, you, you, you led me through these steps, but there's still something which I don't understand. So you wrote this expansion in Eisenstein plus cusp forms, which was basically a Fourier transform respect to SL to Z. So I, I'm used to, if I want to compute the Fourier coefficients of a function, I have to know the full function normally. But you are saying no. In fact, I don't need to know the full function to compute the coefficients. I just need to know this, a particular part of this function, which is Z, or Z spec rather, which corresponds to the J equals zero and J equals one piece. Yeah, so, so this, uh, uh, this, this, th is there any analog, uh, other analog that will make me comfortable of when we have a Fourier expansion, but to compute the all the Fourier coefficients, I actually don't need to know the full function, but just a piece of that function. Hmm. 
I don't have a good answer. So <clears throat> the way, let, let's go back. So, so the way one, forget about the cusp forms for a second. Um, if one has a function and one wants to compute this, this overlap, um, one takes advantage of special properties of the Eisenstein series to equate this overlap with a certain integral of just the scalar component of f against uh, y, the imaginary part of tau. This is known as rankin selberg rankin selberg method. And so there's an explicit formula that says overlap with Eisenstein equals integral of uh, zeroth component of f. So it's just a Mellon transform in the end and takes advantage of the special modular structure of the Eisenstein series. Okay. So, but I, yes, I mean, I'm not sure I have uh, a far flung analogy, but if I were writing out everything one needs in order to make this explicit, I would have included that. Okay, I'll, I'll look at the paper when it comes up. May, may I ask a question? I think it's it's related, but it's probably a more basic confusion that um, is related, I think. So usually, I mean, this is still a two-dimensional space, right? This fundamental domain. Mm -hmm. So usually if you do some kind of transform from a two-dimensional space, you go to two indices. You need also two, and then, but here you only have index S. So it's, this seems to be where you get all the strength that you, you transform a function of two variables into a function of one variable. I mean, I don't know. If I take the sphere, I decompose in spherical harmonics, I have L and M, right? I always have two. I think this is basically yeah, it's, it's two dimensional space, but there's only one, there's one compact direction, one non compact direction, I think. Yeah, but still, if it's if it's the cylinder, I will have Fourier in the non-compact and some modes, some discrete number in the other, right? It's almost as if this becomes a line along. Some yeah, region. yeah. This is what is looks so powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Must be some particularity of how the volume of the space degenerates uh, along the direction where it's not compact. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any other questions? There's a question in chat. Sorry, I can't see chat. Um, okay. Got rid of that. Um, it's a common. Can someone read it? I can't see it. I'm sorry. Uh, so Alex, uh, can you just? Uh, so Alex Maloney is saying oh. that. Uh, oh no, I, I I was just responding specifically to Slava to reiterate that I think you're correct. It's correct to be surprised by this because this is a highly non-trivial fact um, uh, about SL two Z. So, okay. but I the but. Uh, yeah, I didn't really have any. This was not a question. Uh, it has to do with orthogonality of the cusp forms, not just on the fundamental domain, but also with respect to these individual Fourier coefficients on the whole upper half plane. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, the proof of this involves, for example, the fact that these cusp forms are not just eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, but simultaneous eigenfunctions of an infinite number of other set of operators known as Hecke operators. Um, okay. Which can be, which, so, I mean, it's fancy number theory, but I don't have any insight aside from saying that it's fancy number theory. I mean, maybe Eric has some better insight. Oh, no, no. Uh, yeah. I, I do not. <clears throat> um, all, all right, I'm, uh, guys, I'm already happier that it's not some very basic but, the no, but that's a it's a great question that you're asking. But can I can I ask again? So maybe I'm missing something. So are we just considering really the 
the space of square integral functions in the fundamental domain and just looking at eigenfunction of Laplace. I mean, are we imposing some extra constraint? Or, but it just looks too, I mean, it's just a, spa a two dimensional space and we just look at eigenfunction of Laplace and as a complete basis, how is it possible that we lose one, one index? No, are we, is there something else that I'm forgetting? I think that this is not because it's more powerful, it's because it's less powerful. You're, we're, we're used to cases where you can use separation of variables, but because of the identifications on the fundamental domain, it doesn't separate. So you just have to lump everything into one big sum and that's the index N. Okay, but if I, if I choose some geometry, like say a cigar geometry, which is not very different topologically, right? And I I choose some metric on a cigar and try to do harmonic analysis there. Okay, you shouldn't I have two labels? Is that the, the confusion that you, you think I will not have two labels in such a case? With the two labels correspond to separation of variables, right? I mean, you could you could give them one name I think I understand Zhao's question. So let me reformulate. So Zhao is saying that for the non, so there's going to be a, indeed a certain number of discrete uh, eigenfunctions corresponding to the bulk of the domain. And those ones we can number with a single index and that's fine. But how about the non-compact part of the domain? I see. So Zhao thinks that for that, if, if it was just a cigar, then he would say we would have to have a family of functions numbered by a continuous index S, say, and, and a Kaluza clan index going around that direction. So there will be two, two indices, S and K. And that you would not be able to repackage in some discrete index. You would really have to deal with this. But here we don't see it. We just see a single index S and there are no Kaluza clan modes around that direction. And so this, uh, this looks a bit surprising. Thank you, Slava. Yeah. But this must be due to the fact that the volume grows very fast somehow in that direction and there is no Kaluza client, uh, something like that. Well, perhaps, is, is, it, is it perhaps re re related to, to, to the fact that, that we, we are not really de decomposing any, any, any function in the fundamental domain, but a, a function which is to the invariant? Like if you know if, if we if we were decomposing any, any function, then it looks like we would need two two indices. But but we, we are restricting to, to a very special class of functions. It, it, it may be it may be totally wrong, but I would have thought that having restricted to the fundamental domain that doesn't buy anything. But uh... ah, so this function f of tau is supposed to be a so to z invariant. Yes. Yeah, I guess this, 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 this decomposition would not be true if, unless f, f is actually more invariant because all the terms on the right hand side are mm -hmm. invariant. Okay, yes. okay, okay. Then this this is a still another piece of. Uh... No, but uh, but I mean, if you, as Eric just said, if you restrict to the fundamental domain, this is just some identification, right? It really has to be periodic, but it's, it's just the gluing of the fundamental domain. But inside the fundamental domain, it can be anything, right? Yeah, that's true. This is kind of vague, but I, I think intuitively it's because the you should think of the the discrete sum as coming from the the bulk of the space and and the continuous part as coming only from the cusps, mm -hmm. and the cusps are very pointy, so they're they're sort of one dimensional. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. I, I think that the cusps are are very pointy and the L2 normalizability condition means that things have to fall off quite rapidly at the cusp. Um, so I think that's probably the right intuition. They're like cylinders of, of, of radius zero, effectively. I see. So, so I, I can think it's like a sphere right. and then uh, I'm just the spherical harmonic instead of L and M, I just count, it's a countable set. I, I keep going with yep. just one yep. integer, you say. I mean, I mean, one piece of intuition that might be worth stating is that 
The cusps are sufficiently pointy if that you give any, a mode any non-zero angular momentum around the circle direction, it'll violate the L2 normalizability condition. Right, that's the statement that the Eisenstein series have only, oh, no, I, I said that incorrectly. Ignore that statement. The statement is that they need to have scalar support uh, in order, uh, these Eisenstein series always mm -hmm. have scalar support. Sorry, I made an incorrect statement. Okay, I have another question that it's, okay, I guess very speculative, but what if we go to higher dimensions to like to a three toros? Is there a similar harmonic analysis you can do on some SL3Z fundamental domain and get a similar result? Not for, uh, not for dimensions, but I guess for energies on a two toros. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a nice question. I don't know. The, I don't know the catalog of what is known about spectral analysis for all such higher spaces. I know that for, for some of the SP 2GZ groups, which are relevant for 2D calculations in higher genus, spectral decomposition is not known in nearly as much detail. Um, I don't know about SLD comma Z. Um, I suspect not as much as this is known, but it's a nice question. I, I'd, I'd have to look into it. Thank you. Okay. Well, if, if there are no further questions, shall we thank Eric for a fantastic talk and uh, amazing results. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks to my yeah. collaborators, especially those who showed up. So. So we are all uh, we are all deserving a weekend's rest, and see you all next week. Sounds good. Thanks. Bye.